At the huge Willow Run factory in Michigan, where warplanes were made, the first new cars of the Kaiser Fraser Company are designed and built. The first models are handmade and are the forerunners of hundreds of thousands which will be turned out under assembly line methods. These newest entries into the highly competitive automotive field go on display in New York. Mr. Kaiser produced hundreds of Liberty transport ships for the Allied war effort. Now he and Mr. Fraser present their peacetime product. The six-cylinder Kaiser car features front-wheel drive. The 100-horsepower Fraser car is larger and heavier. After four years of war production, the American automotive industry reconverts to peacetime needs. And in Texas, the automobile takes to the skyways. Out of the air and onto the road comes the flying automobile. All the driver needs is five to eight hours flying instruction and a pilot's license. In the hangar, the propeller and wings are removed, and it's an automobile. The flying automobile uses half as much gasoline on the ground as in the air, but is economical anywhere. The modern businessman completes his air trip at the garage of his home. Modern science gives the automobile a lift at 120 miles an hour. In Philadelphia, the United States Mint begins the stamping of a new coin bearing the profile of the late President Roosevelt. Two billion, seven hundred million of these new ten cent pieces are being coined. Mrs. Nellie Taylor Ross, director of coinage, inspects the new pieces and the original model. The new coin makes its appearance just as the annual campaign against infantile paralysis begins. President Roosevelt, himself a victim of the dread disease, inaugurated the annual campaign to fight it. In every state and town in America, the people contribute their 10 cent pieces to the cause. And in Washington, Mrs. Harry Truman and the president's daughter make their contributions. Outside of Xingbiang in the tangled jungle of northern Burma, an American rescue patrol searches for a plane which crashed only three minutes by air from its base. The wreckage is only six miles from the base, but it is a day and a half trip for the rescuers. The pilot is found too badly injured to go back by trail, so an airstrip is hacked out of the stubborn tangled jungle growth. Emergency supplies, food, medicine, and equipment are parachuted to the rescue workers. Expert medical care is given to the pilot, who must be strengthened before he can be evacuated. Using dynamite boxes as graders, the slow, painful construction of the small airstrip takes two weeks. These official Air Force pictures show how fallen airmen, often completely isolated from civilization, were rescued. A helicopter of the 10th Air Force lands precariously in the tiny clearing, only 80 by 50 feet. Treacherous air currents add to the hazards of the landing. The injured pilot, carried in a litter, is strapped aboard the helicopter and dispatched to a base hospital for treatment and convalescence. During the war, hundreds of men were dedicated to the heroic and unsung task of saving life against almost insuperable odds. In London, a state dinner has just been tendered representatives of 51 United Nations by King George VI. Delegates to the first General Assembly of the United Nations Organization here to convene a meeting that may well determine whether peace will prevail on Earth, whether the children of all the nations are to live.
25 years ago, the League of Nations was born, only to die of anemia in Geneva while men bled in Manchuria and Ethiopia. For the second time then in a generation, the wounded nations of a world convalescing from war have met to discover not only the means of their survival, but also their right to survival. Remembering the failure of the League, five years of battle and agony, and the implications of the atomic age, the delegates are realistic. But remembering these, they must also be prepared to surrender, if need be, certain sovereign rights to the common rights of man. Dedicated to humanity and hard common sense, they listen to Britain's Prime Minister, Clement Attlee. We realize, as perhaps never before, a choice is offered to mankind. Twice in my lifetime, a war has brought untold sorrow to mankind. Should there be a third world war, the long upward progress towards civilization may be halted for generations. And the work of myriads of men and women through the centuries be brought to naught. It is for us today, bearing in mind the great sacrifices that have been made, to prove ourselves no less courageous in approaching our great task, no less patient, no less self-sacrifice. We must, we will succeed. Under the global emblem of the United Nations, the General Assembly conducts its first piece of official business. Ballots are distributed for the election of a president, with the United States and Russia favoring the Norwegian delegate, and Great Britain supporting Paul Spock of Belgium, the balloting proceeds. The secret balloting completed, a count of 28 to 23 gives the presidential chair to Paul Spock. 51 United Nations have organized to give the civilized world another chance. To the sunshine of Florida comes a distinguished vacationer, England's wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In the United States for a nine-week stay, he and his wife are guests of a friend at Miami Beach. Included in the Churchill luggage is an easel and several canvases, on which the famous statesman plans to indulge his favorite hobby of landscape painting. Mr. Churchill grants the press an informal interview on his host's front lawn. Mrs. Churchill wears a corsage of Florida orchid. Mr. Churchill tells the press that he has no weighty statements on world affairs. He is strictly on vacation. At nearby Hialeah Track, the winter racing season reaches its peak as 30,000 turn out in this beautiful tropical setting for a day of sport. The day's big race is the $10,000 inaugural handicap. <laughs> Vacationers from the chilly north crowd the stands and try to pick a winner. They're off. Fighting Don, the favorite, takes the lead. Into the stretch, the favorite is still in front. But QED number nine is moving up. It's a close finish, and number nine wins by a nose. 